Welcome to Garden Success with Stephen Brugerhoff, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Stephen Brugerhoff. Well, greetings and howdy, everyone. Hope you all are having a blessed day, a great day today. I know I am. We just have come off of a, a great professional development conference. AgriLife Extension Service uh, has provided an outstanding professional development conference for all AgriLife staff over the past few days. It was a great opportunity to meet with friends and colleagues, catch up a little bit on what we're doing. But the important thing is to be recognized by Extension. So we thank Dr. We thank um, Director Avery for his support and all the staff for putting this uh, excellent conference on for us. I, I just think it was outstanding. Can't say enough good things about it, and I do feel appreciated. It helped us uh, understand a little bit better how much of an impact we have on the residents of Texas. Agricultural production for me and my position, I affect our community through residential questions about landscaping and gardening. Of course, if you do have a question, we ask that you call in. This is a live call-in show, so please call in 979-845-5689. We'll be here till 1 o'clock receiving any of your questions. If you have any successes or some challenges in the landscape, just call on in. We'll, we'll go ahead and talk about it. Remember, it's just us talking, right? It's just friends talking to each other. Now, I do come prepared with uh, some information that I'd like to share with you. Of course, last week I talked to a gentleman. He was talking about raising jujubes, or jujubes. Now, those are fruiting plants from China. It's an interesting plant cultivated. You can cultivate them easily here. Uh, there are some challenges with jujubes. Um, they'll produce a, a fruit that tastes wonderful. There are some that are cultivars that are popular uh, in the landscape. Lee and Lang are two of those. I believe his question was, um, can they be uh, planted, can they be grafted onto a rootstock? And of course they can. But I told him I'd get back with him with some information and some colleagues that he should talk to. I think he was interested in cultivating an interest group to talk, to explore more about cultivating jujubes in our area. Now, our colleague, who is now the uh, head of horticulture and landscape architecture for Colorado State University, that's uh, Dr. Meng Meng Gu, she was involved with um, research on jujube varieties that we can grow here in the area. And before she left, I was asked to help review uh, an article or a fact sheet talked a little bit about cultivation of jujubes. So, I, I actually did find that particular article. I was looking around for it. Of course, uh, our extension uh, service, as well as the Tamu Systems, does have a place where you can find articles online. You can download them there for free. Most of them are for free, some are paid for, but this particular article on jujubes you can find from AgriLife Learn. So I downloaded it, sent on the information to our, our uh, client, our resident, who called last week, and I think we're on, a, on the right track. I also contacted Dr. Gu to see if uh, she could provide any additional resources for her. Now, I'm also going to contact a uh, local uh, professor, assistant professor, uh, Dr. Tim Hartman to see what the um, status is of the uh, plants that are currently out at the research uh, orchard here in College Station. So we thank you very much for calling in and asking about particular plants that we like to cultivate that we can cultivate successfully. There's a few other plants that we can work with. Of course, if you have any questions about gardening right now, um, certainly we can garden successfully and start looking forward to gardening for fall, right? So if you're thinking about planting out, putting in plants for fall gardening, you can work successfully with vegetables like peppers, 
peppers are a good plant to put into the ground right now. Now, I don't recommend putting them in by seed. If you're going to be working with peppers, it's best to put them in by transplants, right? So plants that are already grown up. Same thing with tomatoes. We want to make sure that we're putting them in so that we can get a fall harvest off those plants. And right now is the best time to be doing that. Now, uh, I, I went out to a, a local, uh, local place and I got myself a yellow pepper. I thought it was a great opportunity to try to raise that. I've got some tomato varieties that I have been cultivating all year. What I did was after they stopped producing, and these are indeterminate varieties, I went ahead and cut them back. Now they were still producing but there is a little trick you can do to kind of extend the um, the work off of those tomatoes. If you have a, if you've already been cultivating them in the spring, basically you just kind of cut them back to the quick about six inches, maybe ten inches off the ground, and try to cultivate the new growth that's coming off of that for a fall harvest. Uh, one of the ones that I purchased and I bought it as a transplant, it's one called Lemon Boy. Lemon Boy is an interesting tomato. Produces a pure yellow, golden yellow fruit on it, and it tastes amazing. Not too acidic. You know, I love my red varietals, but certainly Lemon Boy is going to work for me in my fall garden. Now, uh, this is also a time to be considering putting out other plants for a fall garden. About mid-August, you might consider summer squash. So when I say summer squash, you know, it's not, it's not one of those like a butternut squash. You can certainly you could try a winter squash, but summer squash are those yellow crookneck squash. You go into the grocery store, you might see them. You know, seasonal plants that are available for us to use. Um, you can plant those by seed right about now for a fall harvest, and you can still work with cucumbers as well. So putting cucumber seeds, you'll start working for that now. Another uh, couple of vegetables you might consider in late August are green beans. You know, put those in by seed. Now, another plant which, you know, I never really considered before, and if you have experience doing this, you know, of course, call in or send us an email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu are Irish potatoes. Now I know, I know. You're thinking, well, Irish potatoes are spring uh, harvest plants. Those are plants that you put in in late winter. Uh, there is a very small window where you can work with Irish potatoes right now. A very small window. You can put them in right around mid to late August. Uh, just think, just kind of uh, count back. We anticipate that within about 110 days you'll get a harvest off of potatoes when you put them in the ground. Now, you work with them a little bit differently here in the fall or in late summer, mid mid to late summer. To work with them successfully, of course, you have to find a resource for those potatoes. They're more readily available in late winter or early spring as far as purchasing them. It's going to be a little bit difficult to find some right now, so you may have to rely on online resources for those particular potatoes. But, you know, just go ahead and get them. You'd prepare them similarly. There's one difference for fall, fall gardening with Irish potatoes. You don't really want to cut them up into segments. You, you're going to want to work with the entire, the entire potato just as a, as a seed. Think of it as a seed potato. So go ahead and, you know, let it rest for a little bit. Put it put it into a, uh, yeah, go ahead and let it rest a little bit. Um, you may want to cover it with a little bit of a damp cloth, uh, get it to sprout just a little bit, and then uh, plant it in a raised bed. We've got some fact sheets online to be able to tell you how to do that. You can find that information online from AgriLife Learn. Now, um, those are just some ideas that you can continue to cultivate plants, vegetables, for a fall harvest. 
So if y'all, uh, certainly I'd love for y'all to call in uh, at 979-845-5689. We're here online till about 1 o'clock. We're really happy that you're there supporting us as well as uh, participating in this program. Now, what spurred this was another uh, person that had, that had written me an email, uh, Susanna. I believe she has worked with okra successfully. And she was asking, what can I put in the garden at this time? Well, I said, Susanna, that's your answer. You can work with peppers. You've got some tomatoes. You could work with, of course, green beans. And, you know, I'd say leave the Irish potatoes for... Uh, for folks with a little bit more experience. So hold off on that. But just know that you can, there's the potential for working with Irish potatoes as well. Now we've got some, uh, of course, there's always events that are ongoing uh, throughout the month. Once we get through July, we're heading back into another season where there's some opportunities to get out and around, go to natural areas, enjoy our city parks, as well as participate in some programs that are upcoming. There is a great program, looks like a great program, sponsored by Rio Brazos Audubon Society. It's going to be Saturday, August the 3rd, starting at 7.30 a.m. at Lick Creek Park. Now, if you've never been to Lick Creek Park, that's a little bit, let me think, that's south of College Station proper. It's a great park, several hundred acres out there. They do have a community set. They do have a, a service center, you know, a nature center that they host programs at. But these programs, this particular program, sponsored by the Rio Brazos Audubon Society, is going to go over the basics of birding. So this is a free program for you. They'll also offer some materials that will help you be successful at doing this. So they'll have some binoculars, field guides, some apps that they'll recommend for having a successful birding experience. If you've never done this before, now's your time to go out and do that. Again, this is a free program that's offered by Rio Brazos Audubon Society out at Lick Creek Park. We've got other parks in the city, of course. Lick Creek Park is one of them. In the inner city, Wolf Pen Creek Park at 1015 Colgate Drive, it's a 63 acre park with about two and a two and a half mile trail system. It's a very popular place. My wife and I went out there one evening just to enjoy a little bit of nature. It's kind of part of the uh, park itself. The trails are kind of close to the uh, highway, but I don't find that distracting at all. I thought it was a wonderful park to explore and, you know, a great place to uh, enjoy nature and try to botanize at night. If y'all have ever tried to do that, it's a little challenging, but I really enjoyed m myself while I was out there. Of course, if you want to find out more about parks in Bryan, you can go to the parks and facilities. You can go to the City of Bryan website, go to the Parks and Facilities tab, and look for listings for park type. You can explore parks uh, through their system by looking through their amenities, um, They've got a great uh, search engine online, so you can look for things like uh, trails or butterfly gardens or more. Now, most of, there are quite a number of parks in both cities, of course. Um, there's quite a number of recreation facilities, but for me personally, I love to go to some of these parks that host natural areas so I can walk around the park and enjoy nature. Um, don't forget, um, we've got other programs coming up in August. August 15th, the Brassus County Master Gardener Association is presenting Gardening with the Masters at our Demonstration Idea Garden. That's off of Highway 21 West in Bryan, Texas. Starting at noon, one of our Master Gardeners, Robin Bodecker, who talks about first for fall. So fall planting, that is. So if you're thinking about fall planting, vegetable gardening, or ornamental gardening, you'll get some great information from Robin. Again, that's going to be August the 15th. It's a free program at our demonstration garden. Also the same day, the native, the uh, Texas Master Naturalists and the Post Oak Chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas are going to be hosting a program 6.30 p.m. in the evening. Donnell Frank will discuss the soil food web 
what's in your soil. The public's invited. It is a membership meeting for the Texas Master Naturalist. But of course, we're always uh, welcoming folks out to that. Now, that will be at the AgriLife Extension Office off of County Park Court in Bryan, Texas. There's some more programs that are coming up, but I think I'll get back to uh, some of the um, some of the emails that we've received. Now, you know, of course, uh, people that call in or send in emails, it's kind of across the board, the kind of questions we get, you know. So in my position, I'll have questions about lawns. You know, maybe my, my grass is uh, yellowing up a little bit. Oftentimes, we associate that with a fungal pathogen. Of course, you know, if your lawn is, if you're having ch- challenges with your lawn, Um, samples are always a good way to start this off. Photos can help, you know, for some more obvious um, expression of pathogens. But if it's something that's a little bit more, I guess, a little bit more abstract or not as obvious, right, it may actually require a sample. Now, if you you do have the opportunity to do so, you can come to our office, the Extension Office at County Park Court in Bryan, Bring in a sample. We'll be able to examine that and get back with you in a timely fashion. I did have a resident that sent me a um, an email through Garden Success at tamu.edu um, that did have such an image. It was an image that had a ran- random yellowing pattern in his lawn. And I said, you know, well, I can't really figure this out. I- I'm going to request you to go ahead and bring in a sample. So he did this past weekend. And that was wonderful. I found out from this resident that he is an active supporter of Garden Success. He's an active listener. He loves the program, going to continue to support us. But of course, he was a little concerned. Now, he tried everything that he could think of related to what we think it might be. So, you know, my first reaction when I saw the image was, hey, this might be potentially, it might be uh, take all root rot. There may be other fungal pathogens at play. I did ask the question, you know, he said he had a dog. I said, well, um, how often do you, does your dog use the lawn as a, um, as a restroom? But the pattern, you know, it was a, kind of more of a random pattern rather than a targeted pattern, right? It wasn't decay in a, sp- in a specific area. It was just very, very random. So I said, you know, go ahead and bring in that sample. And he did. And I asked some questions. It was an opportunity to visit with him for a little bit. So once I get out my magnifying glass, I'll be able to look at that and get back with him and tell him what I think it is. Now, if we can't figure that out, of course, you, would, you know, we may go to the next step, which is taking a sample, submitting it to the uh, Texas Plant Diagnostic Lab here on campus. You know, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service does have a diagnostic lab where they examine plant material, you know, if it, if there's a particular uh, pathogen that we can't recognize from our office through images or through uh, those samples, then we'll request uh, the, um, the uh, citizen, the resident, to go ahead and send it on to the lab for investigation. Their very outstanding staff is directed by Dr. Kevin Ong. We have some wonderful plant pathologists, and they'll help figure out what's going on. So, you know, bring it into my office. You can call up my office as well, and we'll make an arrangement to uh, go ahead and store that for you and send it on. Well, folks, I really do appreciate your support and listening to the program. Of course, we always like a little bit of interaction. 979-845-5689. We'll be here till 12 o'clock, helping you discover some parts of our natural world. Now, I mentioned a few moments ago tree pathogens or pathogens, right? So when plants themselves, when they start to, oftentimes we, you know, we cultivate our lawns, we cultivate our landscape. And I think we all do that with best intentions. But sometimes, you know, nature takes this course and things get away from us. And, you know, we, we'll see something happening in the lawn and we're like, something's wrong. What do I do about that? So that's when you call me up and we'll help explore that together. Now, uh, recently, I have had some questions about trees, right? 
I had a client that called up and said, hey, I've got a problem with some of my, my tree, my oak, is dropping some limbs off of it. Uh, what's going on? So uh, we were able to examine some pictures of the uh, landscape to look at that particular tree just for a minute. I did identify a few things that were happening on the tree. The tree itself had these little mushrooms, looked like little mushrooms coming off the bark. And I said, well, that's a woody decaying mushroom. Doesn't mean that the tree itself is dying, but it is infected with some sort of a woody uh, pathogen, a mushroom, if you will. So, you know, at least we were able to explore that and talk a little bit about cultivation and maintenance of trees. Well, we do have a caller calling in. Hey, Justin, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Um, my question is about the uh, cobalt uh, plugs that are can be purchased through Texas A&M. The, you get like 75 plugs for like $62 on the website. If I, so I already have St. Augustine. Will they play nice together if I just start plugging in the, those cobalt um, plugs in my lawn? So, or do I have to do anything special? Goodness. Well, you're, you're bringing up a, a topic which I'm unaware of. Did you say that there's a, a cobalt bug that you've purchased from te Texas A&M? Yeah, cobalt plugs. Are, it's, they've, oh. taken, they've modified the... St. Augustine uh, uh, species, and they've like put a cactus gene in it. And so I was curious about it because I have St. Augustine already in my lawn, and I didn't know if there is going to if if they if like my regular St. Augustine would just take over, or if I had to do anything special when I buy the plugs. Okay, I'm gonna. I, I apologize. I'm going to go ahead and repeat what I think I, I, I just heard. You've gotten some cobalt plugs, which is a hybrid of uh, St. Augustine grass, and you're um, plugging it into an existing lawn. Is that correct? Yes. Excellent. Um, and is there anything, uh, any, additional, um, any additional action that you need to take to make sure that it, it takes successfully? Um, Right. Well, I'm not. And then it will take over from my current lawn. Right. I understand. Well, uh, I would have. I'm going to have to get back with you on that. As far as um, I'm more familiar with laying down sod, or you know, if you've got a large empty space in your yard or your lawn, and buying some sod mm -hmm. and then laying that down. As far as interspersing plug and then cultivating that specific plug to eventually take over the entire lawn I don't know if that's going to to occur it really depends on how much empty space there is or what you know um, what the existing conditions are so it is related to that it, it's a little broader um, discussion that I'm prepared to to uh, talk about today um, but Justin uh, can I can you do me a favor Sure. Can you send that same request to me at garden, su garden success at tamu.edu? This is something that I can address with our our um, our turf specialists and ask them mm. what is the broader context of that. But also provide me with some in additional information and even an image or two. Um, what is the? Uh, I, I, I'm assuming or I'm, I'm supposing that you do have um, you do have some areas that the grass has died back and you're trying to uh, are, you're, are you trying to uh, uh, supplement that or or introduce this uh, these plugs as cobalt plugs um, in those yes. empty spaces so that's what's going on all right yeah I'm trying to do that and, and supposed to really reduce how much water you have to put on your your lawn oh certainly yeah that's a great goal especially with St. Augustine grass I grew yeah. up in the Houston area, um, even though, you know, there are issues with, we, we went through the same drought-like conditions that everybody else did. We just had a little bit more water and humidity to work with down in Houston. And this was recently. Uh, but still, you know, we were seeing stressed uh, lawns, et cetera. But here in College Station, I can see that as an issue, certainly with um, 
some of the restrictions that we have had in the past year and and fortunately this year has been a good year for us but we never know what next year is going to bring we're still only at the beginning of august so but yes justin if you can do me a favor and since a little bit more detail to me and maybe a picture and i'll um, send that on to our um, professionals but um for me i'm thinking that um certainly you can cultivate it and get it to grow but it's not i don't feel i don't think it's going to be a dominant species if you've already got a well-established St. Augustine lawn in there. You know, it'll cer- certainly fill in the gaps, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't, only time will tell if it's going to, if it's going to be a dominant species or not, but I'm thinking it, it won't. It might in that one okay. patch. Um, to, to make that happen, oftentimes you have to take out the whole, you know, you have to, uh, it, you can do it incrementally or you can take out the entire lawn and then put in at that point, it's better to put in, in sod, you know, uh, rather than by plugs. Right. But, but, but well, they only sell it in plugs. So. But can you remind me, what turned you on to this um, this variety of St. Augustine grass? Uh, so I work for Texas Agri AgriLife, and one of my coworkers was telling me about it. Yeah. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> so they've had some experience yeah. with it, or they just found out about it, yeah. Yeah, he was he was telling me that he was doing the same to his lawn. That he was just taking the plugs and then trying to get it to be the dominant species. And I just trying to figure out if that was actually possible or if it was, you know, kind of like a futile effort because the other one's going to kind of take over because it's like you said, it's already all over the lawn. Yeah, I, I hear you. No, I don't. I don't think it's going to become a dominant species. Certainly, it'll you know. It'll play well with the other plants, but um, um, I think it's always, you're always going to have a mix in there. But okay. I will follow through. You know, go ahead and send me an email, and we'll follow through and see if I can get a, you know, a perspective from our colleagues that are invested in in that, researching that. Perfect. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Of course, and thank you so much for calling in, Justin. Well, folks, thanks thanks to Justin for calling in. Of course, we encourage you to call in as well, 979-845-5689. We're here till 1 o'clock, and I am definitely ready to, to talk to you about plants. I just love cultivating them. It's one of my favorite things to do. Of course, when I during the day, I'm sitting at, at a desk, but I try to get out in the yard when I get home as much as I can. As a matter of fact, um, last night I ran out of time with uh, I intended to put some of these plants that I was talking about earlier. You remember I was talking about tomato plants like Lemon Boy. I'd purchased that as a transplant. Best time of year to put it in the ground, of course. I'm really looking forward to the fruit, and I know that I can successfully raise those tomatoes. I've got a few other tomatoes as well that I've been cultivating and nurturing since spring. You know, I've, I've been doing this for a while, and I know, you know, if I cut them back about, you know, pretty pretty low, I can continue to cultivate them, and I'll get a few more tomatoes out of varieties that I currently have. Hey, Dottie, thanks so much for calling in. I really appreciate it. What are you doing? How are you doing? I'm doing well. I have a quick question. Behind our house, we have a pretty thick copse of some yopon and a bunch of trees that have of random varieties that just kind of sprang up on their own. And a lot of them are, you know, scrubby trees. And then in between there are some beautiful oaks that we would be very sad to ever lose. Um, And so between all the droughts and freezes, we had some trees die, some of the lesser, smaller trees. And we had a person come out and look at them for removal and for cleaning up the, the dead trees. And he observed that part of the reason that they had died was because of the density of the yopon there. And he said that their roots were competing with the yopon. And that. And then I began to worry. I just thought it was the droughts and the freezes that had killed my, you know, killed the trees. But now I'm wondering if there's a more kind of fundamental problem with all that yopon that would maybe put my oaks at risk. What do you think? Well, gosh, I'm trying to think this through on the fly. So scenario, you've got an area in the back of your house, dominant species is yopon, or, you know, as far as an under understory canopy, you've got some other trees that have 
uh, passed on. Is that correct? And what kind of species were they? Were they like um, post oaks or? I mean the trees. Well, the the oak the oaks are solid. They're um oh I don't know that like that century oak type you know um whatever that is but um but the trees that have died one of them is like a persimmon and the other one is I don't I don't really know to be honest um so it's but they're a, not oaks. Oh I see. So um you had a fruit tree that passed on maybe a few other trees um, or woody species in the back. So yes, yopon can be a dominant species in natural areas. I mean, you know, that, that just happens. As far as competition from the yopon for natural resources, I, mm, wow, I'm trying to think this one through. So you've got oaks in the backyard that are doing just fine. They're playing well with the yopon. Yopons, of course, any uh, any uh, species that are back there that are established are going to compete for resources. It's really not a matter of um, root competition per se. Um, it's a combined environmental conditions with the existing vegetation. So, yes, it could be re the uh, death of some of these other trees could be related to the to this harsh environmental conditions that we had last year. This is a general statement. Woody species sometime, you know, what woody species will respond to environmental stressors. Oftentimes it's, you know, in the future. So you're what we had this extreme drought last year in our lawns. We're, you know, actively irrigating and cultivating those plants in more natural areas. We may not be doing that. And so those all the all of those plants are competing for those uh, for those natural resources, and water is one of those. If you change the water course on on certain or water availability for certain plants, then they'll respond in kind. And sometimes it will take a while for that to happen. You know, six to eight months could happen immediately. Could may take a you know a few months to a year to start seeing the result of that extreme drought that we had last year. So it's not an easy answer that I can provide to you rather than to think of the entire ecosystem and the stressors that were already pre-existing as well as currently existing. So bottom line, yeah, the Yopons are a dominant species and they're surviving and the other species just didn't have access to whatever it is they needed. Doesn't mean that the Yopon stealing those resources per se, it just means that those resources weren't available for whatever reason to those other species that were back there, right? So the persimmon itself, is it a, a native uh, persimmon or is it a um, cultivated um, uh, non-native, one of the fruit trees that we uh, cultivate? No, it's native. Oh, it is a native tree. And those are fairly, those are really drought tolerant. You know, that's a shame that that one, that one went away. But yeah, again, um, there, there could be a potentially competition by, by shade. I know that um, persimmon, for me, I, I worked for a while and lived for a while in central Texas, and I was really fond of the native uh, persimmon, uh, the Texas persimmon. I just love the fruits off of them. They're like any, any, uh, fruit tree that produces prune like you know prune like uh, fruits on them you don't want to eat too many of them at one time <laughs> otherwise mm -hmm. you'll never leave the house <laughs> but <laughs> but um but that's a shame that one went away so was it um it, had it been growing up in in a dense canopy like was it growing as an understory plant amongst all these other uh, plants did it did it have a lot of shade because those are full sun plants yeah actually it the the yopon and the other one that died were kind of on the sunny edge of this uh, yopon thick area, so they got plenty of sun. Um, and the oak trees that I'm worried about are fully grown. I mean, they're tall, so they're getting plenty of sun. Um, I just was worried that if it was somehow so thick with yopon that they were killing trees <laughs> that I would really want to take some action to thin them to protect my oaks especially I'd say then yes go ahead and it couldn't hurt to thin a couple of those out especially if they're competing with the other plants themselves so yeah 
Yeah, I'm, I'm walking back on what I was. I'm not quite walking back on what I was saying. I think there's validity to what I was uh, telling you. You know, it's kind of hit or miss. There is competition going on. Um, you know, go ahead and remove some of those yopon. You're going to have enough to um, to uh, continue to cultivate. You know, a, a healthy ecosystem in, in your backyard or in that back area. Um, sure. Yeah. But um, I'm sorry you lost that tree because they're they're wonderful shrub-like trees. You know the yopons, uh, not the yopons. Yeah. Excuse me, the uh, the persimmons. They're just beautiful. How is everything else going back there? Is that the only one? No, we've got even some of our oaks have big limb segments that have been hit by the freeze, and we're that's part of what we're having the guy come out and look at how to trim some of that dead growth off so mm -hmm. yeah they are not at peak right now so i'm hoping that they can recover and get strong you know in the coming season so i'm trying that's another thing i didn't want on top of the past stress for there to be uh more uh, risk with with the com competition from the yopons i got you yeah, do a little bit of uh, strategic cultivation of those yopons. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not laughing at your circumstance. I know this is serious. No, but, no, no. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and take some of them out. But, you know, yes and no to answer your question, right? I think it's, it is that, but it's yeah. also really related to the, uh, uh, the environment, that severe environmental stressors that we had last year. Um, do you have the ability to... Um, uh, put some well you don't really ha I, I would suggest that right now that we're pretty much caught up uh, on our rain you know of course we, we need to pay attention to drought monitors and the status of of um, uh, of uh, those kind of conditions for this year but we've had quite a bit of rain dare I say the unseasonal unseasonably seasonal rains uh, right now so I think we're pretty good but once we start getting into warmer months you know, if you can get some water out there, I'd say try try to do that at least down to a, an inch depth penetration, even in a natural area. It may be difficult to do, though. You may not be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's worth the effort for sure. So, but I'll take this issue of thinning yopons up with my husband, and maybe we can can at least create some space and reduce that competition for the water that is is coming in there naturally too. So, oh, okay. I, I won't keep you up too much longer, but um. Are any of the yopons producing berries for you? Uh, probably, yeah. A few are. <laughs> well, I, when I was uh, just starting this uh, program and co-hosting with uh, our former host, uh, Skip Brichter, uh, we had an opportunity to talk about yopon, and I'll leave you with this. So yopons are a member of a plant family that on one plant they'll produce either all male flowers, right, it's just pollen, or all f on a separate plant, all female flowers, which means they're receptive of pollen and they'll produce berries. So, you know, if you want berries, I'd say, well, either they're producing berries right now or not. When you're selectively pruning, look for the ones with the berries. There'll be enough males out there. <laughs> it's not going to be a problem mm -hmm. for, uh, for pollination. So, but I'd suggest to kind of cultivate the ones that are providing a resource like berries for wildlife as well as for our aesthetic appeal too. Oh, that's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, my pleasure. Well, thanks so much for calling in. Okay. Thank you as well. And bye-bye. Okay. Goodbye. Well, thank you so much for calling in. We do appreciate those folks for sharing some of their uh, information with us. You know, cobalt plugs. I didn't know cobalt was a varietal. Uh, until it was uh, addressed with that, and I think that's wonderful. But again, you know, going back to Justin's um, Justin's question, uh, I'm going to check in with our Aggie turf specialist to see. But I have a feeling it's not never going to be a dominant species. It'll just intermix uh, quite readily with the other species that's already existing there. And of course, we just got through talking a little bit about uh, yopon as a dominant species in uh, uh, on, on the property and uh, some of the challenges associated with that. But again, like I said, it all goes back to last year's stress. We've been blessed with, a, with quite a bit of rain this year, which I think is wonderful, right? I'm paying attention. I participate in a program uh, sponsored by the city of College Station, a uh, water program that's uh, supported and directed by uh, Jennifer Nations, who has a program on Wednesdays. And um, 
uh, of course, you know, we want y'all to conserve water even though we've had our ample share. That means, you know, if you've got an irrigation system that comes on automatically, you might want to change that a little bit. Pay attention to the um, amount of water that we currently have, as well as participate in their programs. I get emails, updates telling me, hey, you know, based on your site conditions and your zip code, maybe you should consider uh, adjusting that schedule or just turning it off because we've had ample rain. Well, we have another caller. Hi, Susan. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm I'm chipper. I was out of breath earlier. <laughs> it happened before. It happened again. And then, you know, well, snap out of uh, it when somebody calls in. It's amazing. <laughs> I understand. I got a cough going to visit Alaska and trying to get rid of that as well. But <clears throat> so I have a question. I have like a several different varieties of winter squash slash pumpkins that I threw out in different sections and then I just kind of in a big area plowed that in. So I have a variety of things growing out there. All of them are in that family. What do I put or should I put anything on them when a few of them are starting to get almost like a white powdery top on the the top of the leaves. Oh is that my. a fungus or is it a bug or should I spray it? Should I? Well, potentially it's powdery mildew. <clears throat> uh, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'll see. Like uh, when I've grown my zucchini, for instance, in earlier spring, right. and then it starts to... I don't know how to describe it. You tell me if if you've seen the same thing. It's almost like a looks like a white skeleton like pattern. I don't know how to describe it, but you know, it's a, a little white patina. How's that? Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, that occurs on the. Uh, and it's not on every one of them, but like I said, I got several different varieties, and I don't even know what's out there because I just had seeds that I had saved and threw them all out and was going to get what I got out of it. <laughs> Of course, of course. Well, you know, um, I don't recommend home remedies. Um, you know, I was told that, uh, that um, you know, when I was growing up, just put a little bit of baking soda in water and spray it on that, and that'll help get rid of it. Yeah, yes and no. Um, that kind of a remedy isn't, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend that. It's, it's um, one, it's not measured, it's not formulated into... Um, the plant may continue to persist and go downhill. So I definitely wouldn't recommend going on that, but that doesn't really answer your question either. Unfortunately, there's not much um, that you can do once you do get, start getting um, uh, uh, powdery mildew on the plants themselves. There are fungicides that um, that uh, are, um, you know, dare, dare I say, that, are, that can be purchased from local um, resources from either uh, chain stores or a local um, a I'm garden sure center. I have a variety of them. <laughs> yeah. I just wasn't for sure Well, if uh, that's what it was. More than likely, it is powdery mildew. Okay. More than likely. Okay. I'd need to see a picture. If you, had, um, if, you, if you can take a picture and send it into garden success at tamu.edu, of course, you know, I'll be able to check it out, but nine times okay. out of ten, what you're describing is powdery mildew. But unfortunately, once it starts getting on those leaves, um, there really isn't much that you can do for the plant. Now, there are fungicides that you can apply to that that are um, that are formulated for use with vegetable plants. So I'm gonna right. I'm gonna go a little well, bit. Well, tell me this: Does uh, it spread to other plants? Because it's not on all of them. Yes. Should I re- Pull that whole plant up and remove it? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm glad you stopped me. That's the, that's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the direct answer is, well, yes, of course. Okay. Um, you're not going to be able to get well, it all. Do. I don't want to ruin the rest of them. No, that, oh. that'll help at least kind of stop it from, you're right, help from, uh, stop it from spreading to the other plants as well. I know we're in a high humid time right now, and unfortunately these, um, these kind of pathogens can spread through water, um, modify watering. If you're overhead watering, you know. I, I do not water it at all. Oh, you don't? It's been rain. Well, there you go. Um, well, history on me. I'm a farmer's wife who loves the garden, and I try to plant. I mean, I have, you know, enough acres that I can plant as much as I want. 
So I can't afford to water as much as I have room to plant. So I don't water. I just try to plant enough that makes it. Yeah. I, oh, well, that's wonderful. I, that kind of, yeah. that at least helps on your time, you know. Yeah, and, and water uh, is expensive. <laughs> water is expensive. And, and how many of these plants can you give away? And when I, I get too much, you know, when I plant like one one year, I decided that I was going to, I, I, I was gifted seven different varieties of tomatoes, right? And then I was like, I can't eat these fast enough. I can't can them fast enough. So I started taking them to um, uh, to a local um, uh, community service center, um, you know, just to get, get them uh, in a useful place. But I hear you, you know, gardening to, to your, uh, what you can a- actually manage. But yeah, unfortunately right. for this, there's not much. Pull that one plant uh, for the rest of them. Uh, you know, it sounds like you're doing the right things, right? If you're, uh, if you're okay. not watering or even if you are watering, the best thing to do is under water or, you know, below the plants, right. not on the leaves. Try to keep them as dry as you can, but it's almost impossible. And, you know, after these uh, rain, uh, rain events we have. And again, yeah. you know, fun- well, I do have one at the other end of this long patch that I've got that is really wilting. And I was looking at it thinking, you probably need water, but um, mm. I, you know, if I'm going to water it, it'll be bucket watering it out there because it's just too far for a water hose to get there. But oh. so I haven't watered any. So wilting is one problem. And then that powdery mildew, I guess, is what you're saying on another plant. Yeah, you've been gifted <laughs> with gifted with pow- powdery mildew. Uh, one more thing uh. about fungicides. Fungicides are more preventative rather than curative right but okay. there's been limited success with fungicides applied in this condition you know under these circumstances you can might consider them for the remaining plants but you know once they're infected a fungicide's not going to um it's not going to kill that that uh, fungal okay. pathogen in its tracks okay good information yeah and you can't put I a fan out there that. either right well, the, actually, you can see in every direction around my house. So we have a natural fan. Oh. <laughs> God blows the wind quite well at my house. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, yeah. All right. Well, Susan, is there anything else that I can do for you? That's all. You've you've answered it. If I can just go out there and do the work now. Oh, Pull right. it up. The, well, one more, part. one more question for you. Are, are there any other vegetables? Is there any other gardening that y'all are doing in the fall, or is this pretty much it? Um, actually, I grow a large patch of okra, and um, we're farmers, so I am able to harvest my own seeds and plant with a 16-row planter, which I don't put 16 rows of okra, but um, my okra has been doing amazing this year. I pick a five-gallon bucket every two days. Oh, my goodness. What do you so do with all that okra? Close. I Actually, I sell it to people that uh, go to farmer's market and sell it. And I don't promote it as organic, but it definitely is. Um, but I just enjoy gardening. And it's one way for me to get out and get exercise. And I just, I really enjoy it. And we are not in the College Station area. I'm more in the Hill County area, which is just south of the Metroplex. Oh, my. Okay. Well, goodness. Well, I didn't. Anyway, I do have a different environment. We have a broad reach then. Thank you very much. Yes. That's wonderful. I'm a faithful listener every week. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, you, uh, uh, you've made my day. I thank you very much for calling in, Susan. Um, and keep up, you know, keep up the great work. I agree. Gardening is very therapeutic. Um, for me, it's what I do on my off time. Um, uh, my wife is okay yes. with that. Um, you know, <laughs> keeps me out of, I, keeps, I keeps have me future busy. questions in mind that I will be calling you on. I am planning on putting in a brand new garden space with nothing but grass and weeds right now. So a step-by-step step on the best method to get that baby going for maybe next summer planning spring mm-hmm. or something or maybe even next fall i don't know um that's an idea for you just an idea is on how to start a really big project and the steps to take oh that's a great idea susan 
we're right now myself and our our Br- Brazos County Master Gardeners. Uh, we're planning on education programs for next year, and I'm going to be introducing at a meeting that we have next week to start thinking about a series of programs that we can actually implement. We do we have some fantastic programs; they're free. Um, we'll have them at our demonstration idea garden. We also have a monthly series at the uh, one of the local libraries here in in Bryan, uh, the Munts Library in Bryan. Um, but um, we're we're going to provide a little bit more focus and at least start with, you know, I'm going to suggest that we start looking into a series like that. So I'm really glad that you um, have uh, said that. We, the proof is in the pudding. These programs are archived, and, you know, we can always go I can At my meeting, I can say, listen to this podcast, you know, <laughs> listen to this program. <laughs> but I, I thank you very much for your support, Susan. I really do appreciate you. All right. Well, thanks again for calling in, Susan. We've still got some time, folks. If you'd like to, we uh, suggest that you call in at, to 979-845-5689. I mentioned some programs that are going on around town. We're also uh, receiving, and I do um, uh, love it when you all send in emails as well, to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. So I was talking about uh, trees um, I'm really uh, appreciative of the discussions that we've had today, especially uh, with su- suggestions by Susan for creating a series of, you know, basics of starting a, you know, garden, whether it's a small garden or a large garden, vegetable garden, that is. I think there's a lot of merit to that. And I do believe that there's interest in that as well. I'm thinking about releasing some sort of um, a survey tool from our website. I'd like to know what y'all are interested in, our public that is listening, local folks, you know, or if you're not local, certainly we do appreciate your support, but also we'd like to know what you think would make for a good education program. Again, you know, we're, we're thinking about creating series to provide some focus to the education programs that we do provide to our community. So I'll develop some sort of a survey tool and I'll let y'all know when it's available and it's going to be simple. Just what do you think? What do you want to see? What do you think would impact our community and make a difference in your life? And that's what we're all about here with Extension. 979-845-5689. We've got about another five, six minutes. We'd love for you to call in. Um, there's a person that sent in an email just now, but um, I will get to that next week because I'm um, lost in my thoughts right now (laughs) it's a little bit more the email that just came in is a little bit more uh involved i'm gonna have to pay some attention to it but it is related to our uh, discussion of yopon and the next one is going to be nutsedge of course so i think that will create an opportunity to talk about another plant that we love to hate uh nutsedge in our lawns and i'll provide i'll make that a topic for next week so i can be a little bit more prepared and start bringing up some information as well as answer uh, this person's email. So I was mentioning, you know, stressors, environmental stressors last year. Of course, that's playing out in some of our plants earlier this year. We noticed a lot of the the eastern red cedars were were dying um, or they were already gone. I've had some uh, residents that would call in or or send me an email saying, hey, I see large swaths of these uh, plants that are dead, other folks that had uh, called in or had brought that up in conversation saying, post oaks, I've had some post oaks that have been on my property in the back 40, and they've been around for, you know, a really long time, decades, and they just seem to to tank as well. They seem to uh, die, pass on. Um, and the one thing that we can relate that to, of course, is um, it's all, it all goes back to the extreme drought-like conditions that we had last year. It comes down to the availability of resources, and that's part of what our discussion on Yopon is a little bit earlier in this program. If the resources aren't there, if it's a if it's a, a plant, even though it may be decades old, if it's a tree that's decades old, but it's not as deeply rooted as some other species, and that water availability in the soil profile changes, that will affect the tree. Remember, trees, um, Physiologically, trees um, exist. They feed off of these uh, these little root, hair-like structures called feeder roots. 
off of the main roots underground. I wish I had an illustration that I could show you. You'll just have to imagine or look this up on a reputable website online as far as what uh, the underground portion of a tree looks like. So there's these fine root hairs that when water becomes unavailable to them, of course, those root hairs start to start to die. Right? They don't, they're not functioning, they'll just start to, to die and that can affect the entire tree and it may take a long time. It may take months, it may take years, and sometimes those plants can re recover and sometimes they can't. And so we've seen that in, um, you know, in the death of these junipers. Uh, some of the plants that we see occurring naturally are naturally distributed in our area, some of the post oaks, junipers as well. Now, fortunately, we've had rains, but sometimes that's just not enough, you know. So you may have to supplement depending on your circumstance and what's in your yard or in, in your area. If you've got acreage, it's going to be difficult to get out there and, and water those plants. If you have plants surrounding your house or access to water, then you can do it. Again, fortunately, we've been blessed with our lion's share of rain. Currently, uh, at, at my house, it's not a problem. I just cut off the, uh, I reduced the amount of uh, irrigation that is going on in the lawn. There's an automatic sprinkler system that I have, and I just shut it off because we've had enough rain to keep that, um, that Bermuda grass and that St. Augustine grass happy. So it's just rocking, rocking on and looks great. Uh, the trees themselves, I've always treated my landscaping this way. I'm more concerned about the uh, tree health than I am the lawn. So I know every that's not everybody's ticket. Not everybody uh, may think the same way. But in my lawn, in the in the rental place that we have, there's some outstanding post oaks that are out in the yard. There's a cedar elm that's out there as well. They have shown some dieback in their upper canopy, resulted from resulting from last year. I think in between us renting the house and the uh, previous owner, they just you know the the landscape they were in, they were focusing on on um, renovating the house, not so much on the landscape itself. And so the tree suffered from that. So my focus is going to be keeping those trees thriving and surviving. And the lawn will follow in with it. Lawn's doing just fine. So I'd leave that with you as well. Think about the plants that you have. Always think about conserving resources at home. Water is mother's milk, right? We can't, we can't do anything without water. And certainly we need to conserve those precious resources. Uh, I really enjoy uh, providing this program to you, of course. If you have a chance, you have some questions outside in between this one week, go ahead and send out an email to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. I'll be able to answer those uh, emails for you. As a matter of fact, I caught up some, on some emails yesterday. It's an interesting picture that this one uh, resident had sent in. It was an amaryllis and it had this wild pattern on the leaf itself, kind of had this red rim around the, uh, de this decaying spot or this necrotic spot. And she asked, is this an insect? Well, I looked it up. Guess what? It's not. It's not an insect. It's a fungal pathogen that's specific to amaryllis. It's called red blotch. Makes it look unsightly, but it ain't going to kill the plant. Well, folks, thank you all so much for participating and supporting Garden Success. I'm your host, Stephen Brugerhoff. We'll see you next week. We'll talk to each other next week. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Stephen Brugerhoff. Join us again next week as Stephen discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.